This conversation is with rock climbing superstar, Beth Rodden. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. Today we're talking about breaking the perfectionist cycle and being an overachiever. And today's guest, Beth Rodden, is a recovering overachiever. And I say that lightly because she still achieves so much today. Beth got her start at climbing gyms in California when she was 14 and quickly started winning national competitions. Then she began climbing outside and all over the world, setting tons of records. She became famous for free climbing the nose on El Capitan, among completing many other first ascents like free climbing the meltdown, which is an incredibly difficult route in Yosemite, where she showed the world women can climb as good as the men. Then in 2000, she was involved in a really challenging experience. When she was on a climbing trip with her then-boyfriend, Tommy Caldwell, who she married, and two other rock climbers, they were in Kyrgyzstan when they were captured by IMU fighters, which is a militant group linked to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They went six days in the mountains being held by their captors with only a power bar each, no tent, no gear, just the clothes on their backs. On the sixth day, Beth, Tommy, and the two other climbers got away, and the story is something Beth recently shared with Outside Magazine and is now writing about in part of her memoir. I tell you because it's important to know people's backstories. For years, Beth continued to climb and really not talking much of the experience. She married Tommy, who was her first love, but they ended up breaking up in 2008, and at the time, Beth says, she really started dealing with everything she'd been through. Today, she's still climbing. She's a sought-after speaker and a beautiful writer. She's also remarried and has a great son. We talk about what it's like to shatter ideals about perfectionism and achievement, something I've struggled with, something I'm sure many of you struggle with today. We also talk about what it was like to share her true story, her relationship with climbing today, and what it's like to live in one of the most magical places in the world, Yosemite. Enjoy. So Beth, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. We're so excited to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I, I really just want to talk. I know you talk a lot. We introduced you in the intro. You have an incredible story and an incredibly accomplished career. You've gone through some hard times. But I love that you talk about perfectionism and you know, this need to always be achieving. This is something I really struggle with, and I know a lot of our listeners do as well. Can you talk about this? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I grew up in the kind of first generation of kid climbers that came onto the scene in the, in the 90s. And so climbing immediately was this way for me to, to own something. I kind of grew up in the shadow of this amazing older brother. So Climbing automatically gave me this voice and kind of this own identity. And with that, I just kind of dove into the competition and the the climbing scene where I was always pushing and trying to, to do hard things. And I think part of that was always built into me, but it was also probably kind of wanting to prove myself a little bit. And climbing is a pretty easy way to do that. You know, you you succeed when you get to the top or you succeed when you win a competition. And it was a very kind of addictive way to live because I would dream these big goals and I would train really hard for them. And when I would accomplish them, I'd get all these outside accolades and it would feel really good. Mm. And it kind of filled this void inside of me, you know, everybody telling me, Oh, that's so amazing what you did. You're so amazing. And climbing filled that for me a little bit, but having other people tell me that really filled this, this need for affirmation inside of me that, that I think was totally self-imposed. And so I think that I fell into this, this, this way of climbing that a lot of people do. And I did it for almost a decade. You know, I, I set these goals and I went out and I tried to accomplish them and how I, focused myself was trying to control all of the 
outside elements, if that makes sense. You know, I would try and control exactly what I ate or how fit I was or go out on the perfect weather day or pick, pick the perfect route. And I really tried to, you know, clamp everything down as tightly as possible. And, you know, it worked for a long time, but, but eventually life gets messy and, and you can't control everything. And also eventually you can't, at least I couldn't just keep pushing bigger and bigger. And there was this emptiness that I think was always there that I was trying to fill with these accomplishments that just didn't go away. What was the moment then where you kind of broke down and realized that you couldn't keep living the way you were living and pushing the way you were pushing? You know, I think it came gradually. I do remember two specific moments, though. One of them was when I topped out free climbing the nose on El Cap in Yosemite, and it had been a lifelong goal of mine. It's, you know, arguably one of the most famous routes in the world. And Lynn Hill, one of my climbing heroes, made the first free ascent of it the year I started climbing. So, you know, everywhere I went, there was posters of Lynn free climbing the nose. And it kind of just became this thing that I, I wanted to try and do. And so once I finally topped out the nose, I remember sitting there, Blaine, my climbing partner, and then husband at the time up, um, Tommy Caldwell, and being excited and happy, but most of all, just feeling relieved. And it was, it was this sense that it didn't feel and it didn't, didn't give me what I was looking for Hmm. anymore. But honestly, at that time in my life, I, I didn't really understand it. And I wasn't brave enough to dive into those feelings, if that makes sense. Yeah. How old were you? I was 25 at the time. And this was what year? 2005. So I was 25. And I had this seemingly perfect life. And I thought it was perfect. And you know, I was, Tommy and I were arguably some of the best climbers in the world. And we were just living the dream out of our car and climbing (laughs) everywhere and climbing everything. (laughs) So I didn't really want to dive into those feelings. I just kind of pushed them aside. And it wasn't until it happened again, uh, three years later when I climbed my hardest route, um, this route called meltdown in Yosemite. And I remember after that, I would always, think that I'd have this kind of high and this elation after accomplishing something. And instead, again, it was just kind of this relief. And I didn't, I had that high and it lasted maybe a few days. And then I felt this emptiness and this need to pick another bigger project. And at that point, I was just so tired that I, I knew that that wasn't going to fill my, my life anymore the way that I thought it was. Thank you for sharing that. I think so many of us struggle with that. I mean, I'm always looking for the next thing and sometimes it's not as fulfilling as I think it's going to be. You know, how, how have you come to terms with it? And I mean, I still struggle with it. I don't know if you do, but what, what sort of tools and tactics do you use today to sort of break that? And and what did you use? You know, it's been a really long time and a big learning lesson. And I I would definitely not say I've mastered it by any, any means, but, you know, I think it was starting to look at my life and and dissect what really made me happy. And was it these big goals? And and was it being this, you know, professional climber with this fame and, and living this lifestyle. And I started to realize that, you know, I loved climbing, but I missed actually having fun climbing, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, I, and that that fun was not in my life. Like everything at that time was like this driven, focused goal, whether it was, you know, going to be building a house or saving money or the next climbing achievement or, you know, something that there was no room for any, any joy. And I think that that's started to come clear to me. And you know, I was like, man, I just miss going and having fun and climbing with my friends. And, you know, I had probably a handful of years of pretty serious injuries with climbing. And so, you know, I think everything is intertwined. And so I think my mental state at that time really was reflected in my physical state. And injuries ended up being the biggest, one of the biggest learning lessons and gifts for me, because I realized that you know, at the end of it, I was so happy just to go 
climb really easy stuff in the mountains with my friends instead of going and climbing these huge objectives. And so I think I just started to learn to appreciate life and like try and have fun and really, you know, it's going to sound cliche, but just live in the moment because, you know, that is such an important thing and lesson to try and try and do. Yeah. I think you said three things. You said gratitude and appreciation, presence, and then having fun. (laughs) That goes a long way. (laughs) Absolutely. And now you have a kid who I'm sure demands a lot of your time and, and a lot of fun. I want to talk about kind of being a mom because you accomplished so much as an athlete. But first of all, how old is Theo, your son? Theo just turned four. Oh, awesome. So he's at a super fun age. You know, what are some of the big lessons you've learned as a mom? Oh, man, that is a great question. Um, and I'm sure every parent out there has an entire list of, of things. You're, I think it's the greatest teacher of all time is having a kid because it just makes you really look at yourself and then, you know, look at life in a whole new way. Um, but patience, it has taught me patience, (laughs) you know, and I actually thought I was kind of a patient person beforehand, but just having a kid that, you know, in the beginning that having this little human that can't do anything and you need to provide for them in every way. And then as they become their own person and start to be curious and, you know, you want to test the boundaries and, and become into their, their own selves. It just takes a lot of patience. So that I think is the huge thing for me. So what's interesting is, is you said you raise him in Yosemite a lot. I mean, I know you guys spend a lot of time there and you like to raise him in the wild and in nature. Can you tell me what that means and like what it's like to raise a kid sort of, we're so surrounded by computers and tech and, it's, it's really, it sounds really lovely to raise a kid near Yosemite. No, yeah, absolutely. You know, I had a really difficult physical postpartum. And so I was basically in bed for, you know, several months after having Theo. Mm. And I realized then it was the longest time I've not been outside as long as I can remember. And towards the end of that time, I just remember craving being outside in the smell of the trees and listening to the birds and being surrounded by the amazing nature that we all love. And so as soon as I was able, I packed up Theo and we drove up to our home in Yosemite. And, you know, I couldn't do much. I couldn't run. I couldn't climb or or whatnot. But we would just go around every day, you know, he wasn't mobile. I'd carry him around in the ergo and then we'd sit down, you know, in the pine needles. And I just found that I was so much happier Mm. being outside and so much calmer. And it didn't matter if, you know, I'd only gotten two hours of sleep and that I also noticed for him too, it, you know, there's just so much stimulation in nature, you know, the, the sounds of the birds and the big trees up high and the small trees down low and all the pine needles and sticks that, that it seemed great for him too. And maybe I'm projecting there a little bit, but (laughs) you know, I definitely liked it. And, and it just became, you know, sort of our routine and, you know, we kind of fell back into, into my old life a little bit where we're outside all the time and surrounded by the mountains and, and wild expanse that we all love. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about Yosemite. That's a place where I think a lot of us would want to live and you live in Yosemite West, which is, you know, this great little area in Yosemite. You know, what's, what's it like to live in Yosemite? Kind of the amazing parts and then the challenging parts. I mean, the amazing parts are that it's Yosemite. (laughs) It's, I mean, I've traveled a lot of different places in this world and still Yosemite is my, my favorite place. There's so many different things that it offers. It offers the high country. It offers big climbs. If you're into climbing, hiking, there's the river. And, you know, honestly, it's actually really good for kids. The downside is, is socially, it feels kind of like feast or famine, if that makes <laughs> sense. It's like, it, in, the, in the fall and the spring, like there are so many friends and our whole community is there. And then in the winter and the summer, it is kind of, you know, no man's land because nobody really wants to brave the summertime traffic. And then in winter, it's, you know, it's a, it's a valley. So it's dark and cold and, and a bit desolate. (laughs) 
Okay, so I want to go back, but, but really quickly, like if you're going to go, you know, any must-sees, like must-hike, must-climb that, you know, maybe maybe aren't in every single guidebook without giving away your secret favorite spots. <laughs> well, I definitely don't have secret favorite spots, and this is definitely in every guidebook, but after six is my absolute favorite climb, and it's very attainable for for most people, you know, it's five, six, but it goes up the manure pile buttress and it's beautiful and it's just as fun as it gets. So I love that. If you have kids, the, the mirror lake loop is wonderful. I say bike, you can bike out there. You can use a, you know, stroller if they're not biking yet. So that's it. That's a big favorite of ours. And then, you know, hiking anything on the rim. So you get, you get the valley view is wonderful. So out the glacier point road is a really good place to go. Sounds awesome. And and just getting a place to stay there, like any recommendation on how you do that? You know, it is pretty tricky. You have to plan pretty far in advance for campgrounds. Um, I think they open up six months in advance. Uh, if you have a van, I lived in a van for, you know, probably five or eight years in the valley and we drove out of the park every night. It's a bit of a drive, but it does provide a little bit more freedom. And then... Or, you know, they have a lot. You were doing van life before it was cool and hipster. <laughs> I know. I have to say, yeah, like we definitely were living in the van long before there were sprinter vans and that sort of thing. They look so deluxe now. I'm like, man, you can stand up in your van. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so funny. Actually, any tips on just van lifing? I mean, you did it for so long. You know, I really liked van life. It was it was great. It's so simple. You know, you just bring what you need. So although I have to say that was one of the things that I'm very envious of is people have refrigerators now in vans. And that seems like a great, great thing. So you can actually have decent food. What did you do? We just had a cooler. I mean, I can't tell you how many (laughs) canned soups I ate (laughs) and cheese and bean burritos, you know, on those mission tortillas. It was, that's all we lived on. That is so classic. Okay, so yeah, get a van. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you have a van, just go. You can drive outside the park, and that's easy and legal, and and that sort of thing. Otherwise, try and plan ahead. And Camp Four is walk-in. You know, they only do walk-ins, and so if you're going to do Camp Four, just get there nice and early. Okay, so Camp Four, hike after six, and this is some good advice. I completely appreciate it. I, I'm really curious, you know, what's your relationship with climbing now? You, you've you climbed some of the toughest routes, broken records. I mean, you were kidnapped on a climbing expedition with the North Face years ago. You've done so much in climbing. You know, what what is it now? Like, how, how do you climb? That's a great question. You know, my relationship with climbing has totally evolved over the years. You know, like I was saying in the beginning, it was this vehicle for me to try and prove myself to myself and the world. Um, and then it kind of became this desperate thing that I clung on to for my identity. And after kind of going in and out of it, I've realized that climbing is just woven into me and it's like my yoga, you know, it's like my meditation now. So if I, if I can only go out and climb, like I was saying after six and just move on the rock, that just centers me and it just makes you know, makes me think clearer. And, and so I, I love climbing and I'm, a, I'm less desperate for it now, though, if that makes sense. Mm. I, I, I can appreciate it more. And that, you know, if we have a really busy, hectic few weeks, I used to get very anxious about it and, and resentful of what I was doing. And now I, I think I've been able to just look at that time and and really know that I'll appreciate it when I come back to it. So do you climb mostly outside or in a gym or at your house or? Yes, to all of those. Okay. So, you know, if if I'm traveling and, and there's not access to outside climbing, I'll, you know, try and find a, a local gym. Um, if the weather's bad, I'll climb at home in our home gym. What's that home gym look like? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. So we have... We have a home gym that is about, the ceilings are about 11 feet tall, and we have a couple different angles of walls. So one is about 45 degrees and one is about 30 degrees. And, you know, they're just littered with climbing holds and 
and you go through and you, you make up your own problems and your own circuits and your own routes. And then we also have weights and a pull-up bar and this thing called a campus board where it's just these rungs that you, you climb without feet. It's perfect. You know, I, I love home gyms. They're my favorite because you can kind of go in there and do your thing. And I think they're actually especially great for parents because <laughs> they're open late. You can go anytime and you don't have any distractions. You can kind of go do your thing. Any advice on how to build a home gym? It sounds sounds amazing. You know, I've had a home gym. You can the great thing about home gyms is they can be whatever you want. So when I was a kid starting to climb, my dad built our first home climbing wall and it was just these two sheets of plywood, one screwed to the wall of the garage and then one screwed to the ceiling of the garage. And he just, you know, put holds on it and I just climbed to my heart's content. So I think whatever space you have, you can just get creative. And I now with the internet, I'm sure you can Google home walls and find all sorts of combinations. But, you know, even if you just get a hangboard, you know, and that's the, the sort of thing that, that companies like Metolius make where you can put it on a, a, a door frame and then you can strengthen your fingers and your arms if you don't have a space to put a whole climbing wall. Oh, it sounds so fun. Any other gear you <laughs> recommend? I mean, you, you do, you, you are an ambassador for Osprey and some other amazing brands, just like go-to gear that you love to travel with. Yeah, absolutely. For, for packs, I love the Mutant series of, of Osprey. It's a great climbing pack. And then we use their Paco baby carrier for hundreds and hundreds of miles with Theo. You know, we, we trekked him around and, you know, we took it to South Africa last year and Norway. And it's a great thing to be able to, you know, put a kid on your back. And then for, for clothing, absolute favorite climbing piece is the Outdoor Research Deviator. It's just fantastic. So it's, it's a super climbing piece and, and I've used it ever since they, they started making it. Is it a jacket or? Yeah, it's a jacket, but you know, it's really breathable. So I wear it bouldering and then I wear it up on our cap. So it's, it's really versatile. It's a great piece. It's awesome that you're still climbing just amazing routes outside. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. When we come back, Beth shares more of her story and gives awesome advice. This podcast was brought to you by Altessa, a series of outdoor events designed for women who long for a life of discovery. Whether it's committing to a three-day weekend retreat on a mountaintop or an energetic one-day outdoor festival featuring female artists, musicians, and speakers, Altessa has your outdoor aspirations covered. I'll be at some Altessa events this summer, and I'm super stoked to be part of this great event series. There's also some amazing brands involved who make this event possible. So thank you to partners like Subaru of America, Garmin, Osprey, Sea to Summit, Smartwool, The North Face, Hydro Flask, Pro Bar, Solomon, Maui Gym, Black Diamond, Yakima, Olakai, Roxy, Igloo, and Leatherman. You can learn more about the REI Altessa events at altessa.com. That's O U T E. SSA.com. So I'm really curious. You speak all over the world. People have to ask you advice. You know, what do you, what do you tell people when they're struggling with, you know, this, this massive perfectionist cycle and achieve, achieve, achieve. We're in such a world of high achievement and we don't talk a lot about failure. I think that failure and hard times they're uncomfortable and I guess they've been stereotyped as this bad thing, but they really are our greatest teachers. You know, I, for 10 years, I was able to keep pushing and pushing and pushing for achievements, but I didn't really learn that much from them, except that, you know, I can beat my head against the wall and dream big. It was when there were hard times and I started to fail that I really think I learned the most in life. So I think if we can, as a society, and especially as athletes and women and people who are taught that, you know, you have to be these shiny, perfect people, I think if we can start to change the conversation that that the hard times are actually the best times, you know, it, it's they're uncomfortable and you want to get out of them. But if you can kind of sit with it and try and learn from it then that's going to be your greatest lesson, you know? I remember in some of my hardest times around 
divorce and, and things like that, people were like, oh, when one door closes, another door opens. And that's not what I wanted to hear right then, you mm. know, but, <laughs> you know, after <laughs> I was like, wait, no, I just tell me it's going to be OK. <laughs> and they did. They, you know, they said, well, it will be OK, but, you know, you're going to have to learn from this. And and it's really true, though, you know, and, and I think that if people can understand and, and try and really slow down life and and really see the beauty and everything and not just the big achievements and, and especially try and learn from the hard times. That's really going to be when it's, when you learn the most about yourself. Is there a story you can share when you failed or something didn't go the way you wanted and you just really learn from it? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest learning lessons for me came when Theo was about a year and a half old and we were across the street from our house in this park that we would always play in and we were playing there and this family walked in and they had a little boy that was the same age as Theo and Theo's eyes lit up and and he you know kind of toddled over to him and they were going to start playing and I hadn't confronted a lot of my PTSD and, and effects from being kidnapped in Kyrgyzstan before Theo, I was able to just kind of like live in my little bubble and, and just have it affect me and not talk about it. And my immediate reaction was to pick Theo up and take him home because I was scared to be around people with the same complexion or that, that reminded me of our captors in Kyrgyzstan. And once we got home and, you know, I saw Theo's face kind of like longing to go back to the park, I realized that, that my fears and, and, the way that I was affected from Ferguson was now affecting my child and wearing off on him. And I realized that, that I needed to change. So that was a, a huge learning lesson for me that I needed to confront a lot of those things that I was too scared to. Wow. That's, that's super brave that you shared that, you know, you shared that story of your kidnapping and your breakup from Tommy Codwell, your fair, all of that with the world recently in a story written by Liz Weil, who's such a great writer that was really brave, but, but I'm really curious, you know, what was that like for you to share that whole story? You know, it was actually very empowering. There was definitely, when we were working on it, part of me was like, man, is this going to be okay to, to put out there? But what I realized from sharing so openly about my fears around pregnancy and how it would change my career and my body was that vulnerability was this huge asset and this huge strength that really in the climbing community wasn't really celebrated at all. You know, it's kind of this macho community where, you you know, you conquer the mountain. And if you don't conquer the mountain, you fail. And if you share that you're scared, that's showing weakness. And so I think especially writing that article with Liz was actually a great way for me to feel stronger, you know, to put it out there and, and say, this is me and this is what I've learned. And, you know, the response was amazing. And, and people got in touch with me and, and said that by sharing my own bravery, that they were brave enough to confront things and share their own, own things. And I just realized that vulnerability is this huge asset. And at least in the climbing community, it's, it's something that we should start celebrating. Mm. Totally agree. And I'll link to that story in the show notes. It was so beautifully written. You know, any advice to others who want to share their story, but they're afraid? I think that you just need to, to believe in yourself and just, just do it. You know, I remember somebody once told me that if you think too hard about pressing send, then you're, you're never going to do it. And sometimes you just have to do it. Um, and I think that's true in, in climbing too. You know, you just, sometimes you just have to try and it's, it's okay if, if, you know, people, not everybody loves it and, and you just have to believe in yourself. And that's a hard thing though, to believe in yourself. But I think the more you do it, the, the more people are going to, to respond in a good way. And then that's just going to give you, you know, some more courage to keep doing it. So Beth, you have a lot of courage and you also have this like innate inner drive. It has allowed you to be so successful and sure, maybe it's caused, you know, a lot of this perfectionism, but, but you're big on teaching people how to find their own inner drive. Can you just briefly tell me what that means and sort of what that looks like? 
Yeah, sure. You know, that's something that was that drew me to climbing immediately. And I was always into sports. I was always an active kid, right? But in swimming and tennis, you know, you showed up at a certain time, you had a coach tell you exactly what to do, and then you left at a certain time. There was no, there was like a little room for, you know, your self-discipline and your self-drive, but not a ton. And so when I started climbing, there was none of that. There was no coaches. There was no practice time. Nobody really knew about training. You just kind of, you, you made it up and, and you, you were your own coach and you were your own person that, that really pushed you forward. And I unfortunately see that fading a little bit in climbing now, you know, people have coaches and, you know, I've worked with junior teams and, and you go in and, you know, they want to make, they want you to make up all the problems for them now. And, and obviously there are exceptions, but that's one thing that, that is, that I loved about climbing was the problem solving, not someone telling me how to do it, but how to do it themselves. So when I work with kids and women and do my clinics, I really try and cultivate that. You know, I, I try and talk to people about what was it that drew them to climbing and never has anybody said it's because somebody was telling me how to climb. It was because I feel like climbing is something that's built into all of us. You know, every kid loves to climb every, you know, we were just built to do it. And so I really try and cultivate that, that passion that originally drew them to climbing. And most of the time you can find that with other things in their life, you know, that they can, what drew them to their career in the beginning or what drew them to, you know, running or other activities that they love and to really remember that instead of all the other noise that gets put into it. Oh, I love that. I mean, that's why I've always loved individualized sports like running and surfing and now climbing. It's so hard, but climbing is just, it's like no other because you're scared and it's hard and it's outside and you could die. I mean, there's so many great things about climbing and it's such a great metaphor. (laughs) What a beautiful sport. We ask all of our guests this, Beth, if you could throw any party right now, you know, who's coming, where are we, what are we eating, who's playing, and what kind of party is it? Well, we just got back from Norway and this is my third time to Norway, so I kind of feel like it's the promised land and I would have to say definitely in Norway there's all these islands and there's just so much water and coming from drought prone California, it's just so refreshing to be around water. So out on an island and it's, you know, there's rocks and it's beautiful and it's light until midnight and our friends and our kids are all around and we're eating fish and fresh food. And it's just super fun and magical because, you know, you can see the sun at midnight and it's just the most beautiful place. Oh, it sounds awesome. I want to come. Yes, you're invited. (laughs) Beth, if you could tell 15-year-old Beth one piece of advice, what would you tell her? I think I would tell myself that it's okay not to know. I just feel like at that time, it's such a hard time. You know, you're in high school and you're trying to figure everything out. And I think that it's, it's part of life not to know, you know, to sit in those those spaces where you don't know up from down and left from right and and learn from it. Um, I feel like we put so much pressure on kids as a society, you know, extracurricular activities to get into the best college, to, to get the best major, to get into the best grad school and, and go from there. Whereas, you know, I didn't even finish college. I didn't finish a year of college. And I think that's okay. In fact, I remember I was at Randy's, Christmas party the first year that we were dating company Christmas party and I felt like such an adult going to a company Christmas party because I'd never been to one before you know I've been to like my sponsors company Christmas parties but that's just like a bunch of people around a bouldering wall and I was talking to I was talking to one of his coworkers, and they were asking about what I did and where I lived and I told them that I lived in Yosemite and I was a professional climber and then another one of his coworkers came up and Rob, the guy I was talking to, was like, hey, Tim, this is Beth, Randy's girlfriend, and I hate her. And I was like, oh, no, what did I say? Why does why does he hate me? And Tim says, why? Does she have two PhDs? And I was like, no, I didn't even graduate college, but it was because I lived in Yosemite. And here were these people that, you know, were running this super successful startup and, you know, had two PhDs. And they thought it was it was cool that I lived in Yosemite. So I think that you know, just don't push yourself and it's okay not to know. 
I love that. Any books or movies that kind of helped shape you or that you recommend or gift most often to friends? You know, I love memoirs and biographies. I'm working on writing one right now. And so I was going to ask you about that. Awesome. Yeah. Is it with Liz? Uh, I am working with Liz. Yep. Yeah. And her husband, um, Dan, Dwayne. So, yeah. Yeah. He's a famous surfing writer. That's awesome. So when does this book come out? Oh, that is a good question, Shelby. Oh, you're writing it now. Okay. Um, I'm writing it now. So, gosh, I mean, I'm working as hard as I can, but I'm, you know, it takes a lot of time. I would say probably within the next two years, hopefully it'll be all all done and published. Yeah, but my favorite books, I, you know, I love memoirs and, and some sports memoirs. One of my favorite ones that's pretty recent is not about sports at all. It's called Love Warrior. It's by Glennon Do- um, Melton Doyle. And I loved the Andre Agassi books because yeah, so well written, so well written and just showed that it's not this shiny, perfect thing, you know, being this professional athlete, there are so many, you know, ins and outs and, you know, life is so gray. And so I love books like that, that just show the whole picture. It's hard for me to read a book that just paints everything as perfect. Beth, this has been so great. You know, advice to others who want to live more wildly. Just try, if that makes sense. Just go out and try it. Go a little out of your comfort zone. So if that means going for an overnight camping trip for your first time, then then at least just pack the car and start driving. I think if you can just take baby steps to to do it, um, you'll find that it's a lot more attainable. And and I think it is actually becoming more and more acceptable and common to, to live these alternative lifestyles. Like you were saying, van life, you know, so many people are quitting their jobs and living in, on the road or, or working remotely. So I think it's just the more you can get in nature, the, the better. I know I'm so much happier out there. I love this. Beth, thank you so much. I so appreciate you coming on. I cannot wait for your book. Oh, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Beth, thank you so much for your time and honesty. I loved chatting with you. You're a beautiful soul and a true force of nature. Thanks to the crew at REI, at REI's Otessa event series, and the folks at Osprey for introducing me to Beth. Do you climb? I'm really into climbing right now, and I'm absolutely terrible at it. So I hope this episode inspired you to get out there and maybe go climbing, or maybe shed some light about shattering your own ideals about perfectionism and this constant need to achieve. Thank you so much for listening to this show wherever you are and for writing awesome reviews on Apple Podcasts and telling your friends. If you want to support this show, that's really the best way. By telling your friends and writing a review, it really helps the show. We're going to take a week off for the 4th of July holiday, but we'll be back July 11th with a great show from writer Aspen Mattis. So stay tuned, hit subscribe, and remember, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas.